Okay, great. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, it's about 8.05, everybody else will be trickling in, but the nice thing is that I will be doing my best to record all of the lectures throughout the class. Um, the advantage of that will be if anything comes up during the semester where you're not able to attend class, you'll be able to make up the lecture, even if we move in person, so long as the classroom has the correct equipment outfitted for it, I will just begin streaming via Zoom on that and then I will save the recording. So you won't be able to join the class via Zoom if we are meeting in person, but should you be absent from class, you are welcome to watch that recording, um, which is going to give everybody a chance because I know COVID's going around and family you know, can always Always be getting sick and needing to be taken care of. So uh, this is this is going to be a nice way of always having that accommodation available for you. Um, that being said, if you've watched any of the videos that I have posted, you'll recognize that uh, a day in a college classroom, calculus specifically, is worth about a week in high school. So if you miss class and you don't make it up immediately, you are a week behind in a traditional conversation. Um, anybody here who went to a high school that offered AP Calculus has heard the war stories of how difficult that class is. And you've got to think to yourself that that was a class that students had a year to master. They had a year and they had it five days a week most of the time for an hour or an hour and a half. We're going to do the entire thing meeting four days a week in 16 weeks. So like there, there's absolutely no wiggle room in the class. And I know that can be intimidating, but that's why I'm going to try to make a lot of resources available to you all. So the important thing is if you do not like if you're not able to attend for some day, some reason, whatever, you got to reach out immediately. Right. Like don't don't wait a week. Waiting a week is like waiting a month. You don't got time for that. So we're going to be able to kind of make that happen. It's also going to be a good opportunity later in the class when all of the, the enrollment settles down. I'll give you a chance to have some group work to get to know some other people in the class. And you have a chance to swap some contact information because very few people go through calculus as an island. Most people do it via a group and they establish some kind of study uh, system with those people. OK, so let's get started. Today is going to be a chance to really set the culture for what the class is going to be, a chance for you all to interact, a chance to really kind of tell you a bit about me and what you can expect. So let's begin going through here. We're going to do uh, an introduction on what to expect for this class, and I'm not going to bore you with the syllabus information. The syllabus information is posted, and one of the, the things that I am adamantly against using my first day for is to bore you all. There's just no reason for that because we. I want to get your engagement. I want you to get you excited about the class and understanding where we're going to take it as a story. Uh, as a result of this being interactive, if anybody has joined and doesn't have their webcam on, I'm going to make one last plea that you do, because as a teacher, if you would like me to teach, if you would like me to actually be able to like help you learn, then I need to be able to get some kind of feedback from you. And visually, it's amazing if I can see your expressions when you get confused or when you get stumped. It tells me I need to slow down. It tells me that I need to ask some questions or do some follow-up. If you don't have your, your webcam on, that's fine. But understand that this is no longer your lecture. This is the lecture for the people who I can read and get feedback from because they're the only ones that I can accommodate for. Uh, otherwise, you're welcome to throw a lot of information in the chat and give me feedback through that if you don't have a webcam or, or anything else is getting in the way. Okay, so let's talk a little bit here about what is math. It's one of my favorite questions because we don't have like a, a, a solid definition in most people's minds, which I find kind of crazy because for most of us, we've studied this for at least 12 years. So let's do a quick little exercise. Throw in the chat, what do you think is math? So it's always fun when I get to see what different classes respond with. The calculus students are much quicker to the deeper, the, the language of the universe. I love it, Ted. Ah, Brendan's already read some of the instructional stuff. Brendan's on top of the game. Good, good, good. 
So even if you know my definition, you're welcome to throw down there some other definitions because it gives me an opportunity to play off of you as an audience, right? Like, again, this is something we've spent 12 years studying, but notice that like the definitions are wildly varying already in the chat. Now, to give you insight into how I like to teach, I want you all to give answers, whether you know that they're 100% correct or not, but I will always, whether you are correct or whether you are incorrect, I will always push back. I will always push back because it's not about me affirming your correctness. It's about, do you have the confidence in your answer to know it's correct, right? So I'm just going to play devil's advocate with you all all the time. So for example, like I see a lot of the definitions that say something with numbers. So my pushback on that would be algebra actively tries to remove numbers. So it must not be about numbers. Uh, we have um, problem solving. I see problem solving quite a bit. But in fact, most discoveries in math were made before the problem presented itself. For example, computers are founded on an entire branch of math called number theory that was invented way before the computer. So it's not about solving like real world problems. Uh, giving the impossible the possible. Good. What separates it from science then? Why is it different than science? So these are some questions we're gonna go through because we need to understand what math is before I can tell you what calculus is. I gotta kind of catch us back up to the conversation and synergize everything you've ever learned about math because if that's, that's exactly what calculus does. It's gonna be pulling from parts of your brain that are all over the place that you never thought could be compiled in the way they are. But to tell a little bit about kind of like where our class is going, here's, here's the, the challenges I get as an instructor, right? I get a whole lot of like, why should I care? I love the question. Tells me you're engaged. Tells me you want to know where this is going. Um, but let's let's see if we can debunk some of these myths that I've also heard people be told as answers. Like who's ever like, I don't know if you want to like raise your hand as a reaction or just give me a nod in the chat. Like has anybody ever heard like you need to know math because you don't know what life's going to take for you or where you're going to use like anybody heard anything like this? Yeah, maybe a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I, I hate this answer. This answer is absolutely like, I, what? That, that's not an answer to say like, oh, you might is not helpful um, because like most people, like I was an engineer, I was a literal paid like six figure engineer for a while. And like, I didn't do a derivative at work ever. Never once did I do one. Integral, never once did I do one. So like to say you're gonna need the techniques, you're gonna need the computation, I find that to be false. And I find the people to give that answer uh, are usually those who have not had an industry job. So like, and, and most of you are going for industry. So like, I wanna kind of be truthful to where you're at. So let's give another one. Um, it's interesting, right? You should study math because it's interesting. I agree, big fan at the same point. I'm going to go with like, it's not always, right? Sometimes it's absolutely boring. It's tedious. It's irritating. Like you're going to do page long computations in this class. Like it's going to like be hard. Um, so, so sometimes that's not the case, but it's still worth studying. So what about like, uh, it's like lifting weights. It trains your brain, right? It's good. Like I've heard a lot of this from teachers. Um, but again, it's like, is is that really all it's for? Is just a very glorified version of Sudoku. Like, I don't think so. I think it's more than that. So I want to break away a lot of these answers and give you something that I find to be much more substantive. So before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about what it is. We already got some uh, definitions in the class. That's the first big question I have for you is what is it? Before we can talk about why it's useful, why math is useful, we need to talk about what it is. So what is it? Well, we, like, like we've seen, it's, it's multifaceted. We've got problem solving that plays a role. We've got numbers that plays a role. We've got algebra that tries to take the numbers away. Then we've got geometry. Geometry is over here and like, we don't need numbers or problems to tell me that if you put a triangle on a square, you get a house. So like we've, we've got plenty of different angles, but that doesn't tell us what it is. So now that you've all had a chance to see each other's definitions, try throwing me another one. This becomes the challenge of the class is we're going to try to actively break these definitions and then try to rebuild them by either pulling bits and pieces from things that worked or from just starting from scratch and building it again. So everybody see if you can give me a second attempt 
what would be a definition for math? If you've already seen my definition, try to give me one that, that's, that's original as you would have answered before you got my definition. Ooh, creating or finding answers. I like that. Standards and the foundation of life. Okay. So a question for Kayla, if we didn't have life, would that mean that we wouldn't have math? Or does that mean that people who don't study math can't have life? Mm -hmm. Explain the world through numbers. So keep in mind, Orlando, what about algebra? Algebra tries to remove the numbers. Geometry doesn't need numbers at all. So again, these aren't to call people wrong, right? This is to help culture the or condition the culture to say it's not about wrong. It's about are we there yet? It's about is that everything? Do we need to include a one-off? Do we need to consider these little details? So it's not, not none of these pushbacks is to say like your definition is bad. It's to say how would you adjust your definition to accommodate for this? A language that deals with numbers and or letters. Okay, I'm getting a lot of language. I like the language. Applies logic, reasoning to solve problems, including numbers and equations. Sure, sure. Again, with geometry, though, you don't always have equations. Explaining the way that life or the universe works. Okay. But then that makes it science. So let's talk about this. Let me, so like now, that, now you've kind of got an investment here, right? You recognize like it's not so easy. It took me a long time like a long time to come up with my definition because I wanted to come up with something that was concise, that was simple, that you all could carry with you, that works in the variety of applications that math has. Uh, it took a long time for me to get it. And then it took a long time for me to make it simple. And so I've got, I've got my definition and I'll kind of give it to you in a little bit, but here's maybe another way of capturing this. Let's imagine that math was like science, okay? Now, in science, we believed for a while that the Earth was flat. Some crazy people on the internet still think the Earth is flat. That's fine. They can go do that. But if, like, then we realized it's flat only sometimes. It's flat only on small bits. And that over large bits, it's curved. So if we were to treat math like science, then that would mean 1 plus 1 might equal 2 only sometimes. We just haven't found the exception. We just haven't found, like, th is, that, is that the game we're playing, that one plus one equals two sometimes? And that that could change in the future? Like, my hope is that this is making you all a little uncomfortable. Like, it should make you uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable suggestion. So there's something different between math and science. Science is allowed to change. Math is not. Uh, what was it? In, uh, in science, there are theories versus facts. Ah, okay, theories versus facts. So let's see how that all kind of plays. Like here's, here's the best model that I can find for it. You've got a hierarchy and the hierarchy is not in terms of importance, but it is in terms of language where one language is used to help further the next language. So at the very, very bottom, we've got logic and the field that studies logic is philosophy. Philosophy is the field that studies logic. If you would like to go make a logical argument, you could write that as an essay and that would belong in a philosophy class. Mathematics uses logic, but it is not pure logic. It's not the same as philosophy, although it does use many similar elements. And then on top of that, you've got all of the natural sciences, right? So you've got physics, which studies the world, chemistry, which many have argued is applied physics, cellular biology, which is applied chemistry, functional biology, which is just applied cellular biology. Like we have a hierarchy in terms of if you wanted to go through depth in your field, these would be other fields to consider. So we've got a difference here between philosophy and mathematics in that they both use logic, but math is not quite logic. And it's not science because it's not going to change and it doesn't rely on us going and collecting data. Like we didn't determine one half plus one half equal to whole by collecting things. We didn't determine that by like arguing through the different pieces of machinery. 
So this is one of my favorite quotes. This is what I started with uh, when I was trying to build my definition. Math is the compass that leads science out of the labyrinth of misunderstanding. Gorgeous, big, complicated definition. Pretty though, poetic. So it's got this idea of math is a guiding force for the sciences. Okay, but that still doesn't tell me what it is. So what is it? This is my definition. If there's one thing I would like you to write down in your notes for today, it is this definition. I'm going to come back to it every day for the entirety of class. Math is a model of logic. So let's take a moment. Let's try to analyze, like, where did I come up with this definition? Well, because it's not just logic. Just logic is philosophy. But if a philosopher would like to model their logic, if they would like to find a way of describing it through a picture, through a summary, through notation, they will often reach for mathematics. And similarly, anybody here who is going into an applied science field, you will have logic in your field. And you will need to be able to express that logic in a certain way, and you will reach for mathematics to do that. It will model your logic. And sometimes around the symbols and formulas, you will need to write paragraphs of information and stories. That's fine. It's all still math. So math is a model of logic. Because up till this point, you've only seen a small amount of math in your world. Right. Let's look at some of the, this. Is a, this is called the map of mathematics. I've got one hanging up in my office. You can buy. You can study it anytime you want. But it's got like in the very center. We've got like some counting. We've got like the creation of zero. We'll talk about that in this class. We've got some building of structures, and then we've got the the field of structures. Some algebra over here, and we've got some numbers. Like what are the different types of numbers? What is infinity? What's pi? What's e? We've got some geometry and some trigonometry that help deal with spaces. But like, we, oh, and we got some Venn diagrams, set theory. That's, that's, a, that's a part of math, right? We got Venn diagrams, that's some logic. But there's so much more that you just haven't had a chance to see yet. We're going to open up in this class two areas. One is calculus, the formality, the, the logic that is this course, and then optimization, which is an application of calculus out in the real world. But there's so much more. So like, let's just take a look at some of the things that pop off to me. Like I, I see, um, I see finance, whole bunch of math and finance. I think we can all agree. Game theory, computer science. We also have other areas like topology, the study of surfaces, chaos theory, and the butterfly effect, which many of you have probably heard about before, right? We've got group theory, number theory, order theory, measure theory. We've got areas of mathematics that are so broad because all they're trying to accomplish is how can we model this logic? It's a reason why if you've taken a statistics course, it's felt so weird to you because statistics is all of a sudden a new type of math. Well, it's not a new type of math. It's a new part that you haven't seen before. It's trying to model the logic of best guess, which is very different than algebra, which is trying to model the logic of is. One plus one is two. But we would say our best guess should be blank in statistics. So to give you a little bit of argument for this, if you go all the way back in time to Plato's Academy, the very first academy that was ever built, there were three main subjects that were taught. See if you can in the chat, give me a guess of what subjects you think would be so important that they would be taught in the first academy. And then Mario says, I hear that if we lose all the knowledge of science uh, and did research from the beginning, it would come back to the same conclusion of information that was lost. Would math be similar? Just curious. So um, let me see. That's a dense one. Hold on. Let me think that through. Heard if we lose all the knowledge of science and did research from the beginning, would we come back to that? Okay. So, so essentially, if we tried to rediscover math, would we get the same thing? I think that's the summary I'm getting. Mario, you let me know in the chat if that's a decent summary. Uh, the answer is yes. The answer is absolutely yes, because we've already done it. We've already done it as a culture. In about the 1700s, and we will explore this time frame. there was a, a gentleman by the name of Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes had a midlife crisis. He came up with a really big quote that most of us are still aware of because I think it comes up in like a Billie Eilish song. Like it's, I think, therefore I am. Many of us have heard of this, right? So the idea of I think, therefore I am and his philosophical movement made a whole bunch of people go, do I have to go and like touch the number one in order for the number one to be real? Right? 
Like another, like think about it like that. If, if I said one plus one equals two and I wanted to make an argument for that, maybe I'd go grab two apples and I would say, look, I have an apple, another apple, I get two apples. And everyone would go, great, one means apple. And we'd say, no, 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 one could also mean fingers. And we go, okay, so one is apples or fingers. We go, no, 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 no. one is an idea. We just choose when to use it. And they go, well, when do you, like, it became a big issue of like, do we have to see something, touch something, hear something for it to be able to be used in math? And, and the conclusion we came to was no, not at all, because math is not about gathering data. Math is about modeling logic. So we start with logic, then we choose how to express that logic. At no point in the foundation do I need to have seen a thing. And we'll talk about that. All right, some ideas of what came up. Uh, algebra, geometry, and calculus. Uh, that's a lot of math. There's actually more variety in that. Science, math, and philosophy. Good, we got some ideas there. You are right on two of those, James. Uh, math, speech, and writing. Marvin's got one. Science, math, and language. Again, we got one. In truth, there were the three subjects that were taught primarily. First was math. Second was philosophy. And the third was gymnastics because you've got to have an able body if you want to have an able mind. So those are the three subjects. We got math, philosophy, and gymnastics. Now, an interesting thing has developed in class. I don't know about you, but I haven't taken a philosophy class until I got to like college. That means that most people are never taking a philosophy class. That is weird to me. That is weird that like literally the subject that captures our humanity of thought has been removed when it's the first thing we were ever teaching people. Now, the reason why I think that is, is because I think it's been lumped in with mathematics, or at least that was the intention. Mathematics will be the class where we teach thought, logic, modeling, arguments. Do we do that in the K through 12 system? I think it's gotten lost a little bit and replaced with equations. So we're gonna be talking about all of these equations, all of these models through an idea of logic because I think that's one of the most important things you all can take away from any math class is the ability to model different logic or the ability to understand because Plato was off in the ancient Greece. All right. So Last argument for math. We've got things, we've got a culture that was able to take this, which is a, a scrap of ancient mathematics, and build things like this. In a time without heavy machinery, that's bananas. Versus if anyone's seen the show Survivor, you put a bunch of people on an island, you ask them to go build a house, like what do they come up with? They come up with something like this, right? Like let's just compare and contrast like exactly what we were doing with the same uh, like technology. Like it's, it's, it's definitely a difference. So here's an example of how it can get applied in other areas. Does anybody know what this is? I'll give you a hint. It's not music. This is actually a notation symbol for dance. This is somebody who is trying to capture the logic of choreography in a way of communicating it. But you can see that there is logic here in the symbols. There's connection, there is cadence. This is a notation symbol for dance. Now, again, like, is this mathematics? Absolutely it is. Why have we not been taught that? Because very few of us are going into a field in which we're going to professionally utilize dance. It's not about the notation. It's about, can I develop within you all a mathematical mindset? A mindset that says, if I understand I can model logic, then what logic am I currently working with and how might I model that? So that's what we're playing with. So this is why you're all being asked to study. This is why in, a, in an algebra class or a calculus class, I've got people who are going into meteorology. I've got people who are going into engineering. I've got people who are going into science. I've got people who are going into literature or psychology. It's because you will all be working with logic in your field, whatever your field is, guaranteed. So don't take away from this class how to solve problems because you might not have those problems. Take away from it the idea 
the mindset of I can solve problems if I learn a way of notating and simplifying and then challenging those. All right, final notes. Although I like this question, I'm always going to pivot you away from it. Why do I need to know this? I get where you're coming from. Totally do. Because you're invested in how the tuition you are paying is going to get you your future job. I'm on board. I'm just going to pivot it slightly. Because I don't like the why do I need to know this. You might not need to know everything. And I'm speaking from experience. I was an engineer. I did make a lot of money out there. Like I, 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 not to impress you, I'm trying to like emphasize within you that like I'm speaking about this not from theory. I'm speaking about it from practice. It's not about why do I need to know this, right? Because if I could tell you what you are going to need to know, then this wouldn't be a university. It would be a trade school. And you would then go out into the world to produce something that has already been created. Many of you are instead looking to be changing things to be groundbreaking. So I'm going to pivot that question and say, instead, I want you to ask, how can I use this? I like that question better because it opens up a creative outlet within you and it answers the same desire, I think, within you as well. So if you come to me and you say, how can I use calculus in the field of neurobiology? I will go, let's figure that out. Right. Because that, I mean, that's, that's a way that like, you're going to go and make an impact. We're going to figure like, we're going to come up with something like what's a way that I can use this in the field of dance. You might invent a notation system that is commonly used and communicated to people. And like, that's a great way of utilizing what you have learned in this class, whether it's directly or indirectly. And, and you can ask yourself, like, what's a way of synergizing other subjects you're taking in college? Like, how can I use this philosophy class and this intro to music theory to be able to make something? How can I use this chemistry class and my programming class to create something? Like this is, this is what university is about. I'm not gonna tell you where you can use this. I'll help philosophize, I'll help theorize, I'll help create with you, but it's about where can I use this? That's, that's really what I think is the core importance of university versus trade school. And trade school is fine. I'm not bashing on trade school. Big fan. Y'all want to make a lot of money. Y'all want to do it in half the time. Like if your job is just to get a good, if your goal in college is to get a good job and to like go out and set yourself up for like security, oh my golly, drop out of university, go to trade school. Like you can make a lot of money. You're going to get a certificate real quick and you're going to do some good work and help a lot of people. Like I'm a big fan. I just don't think that trade school addresses the same market uh, demand as university does, which is why I'm trying to like always clarify the discussion that this is a university. We're going to try to advance and create. We're not going to try to optimize and, and uh, do. All right. So that's my math. I've got I've given you my definition. My definition is a model of logic. You ever trying to figure out why I'm showing you something? I'm trying to model some logic for you. If you are ever trying to model something and you don't understand it, understand you're not doing math. You are symbol pushing. You are uh, computing at best, right? If you're just doing things because they are the steps you have been told to do, you miss the boat because there's no logic in that. You got to understand what you're doing. Otherwise, it's completely worthless. What is calculus? This is now the, the question that we're gonna be talking about. So what is calculus? Calculus is the study of the idea of forever, which I find like, again, kind of thrilling. Like that's a big dance. So like the definition is the study of forever. We're gonna try to model the logic of forever because it's a word that we take for granted, right? If we talk about like, what's infinity? People go, oh, it's a forever big number. And I'm like, what does that mean? And we go, oh, that just means like it's bigger than everything else. And I'm like, how do you know? I'm like, have you, have you tried? Like, because if I wanted to know that like 10 is bigger than two, I would take 10, subtract two, and I would be left with a positive result. But if I wanted to know that infinity is bigger than two, I would take infinity, I would subtract two, and I would get, I don't know what I would get. Do you get infinity again? Like, does it just circle upon itself? Do you get something slightly smaller, but also bigger than thing? Like it becomes a quite a bit of density here. So we're gonna study the idea of what's forever big, what's forever small, what does it mean to forever change? What's forever adding? What's forever perfect? We're gonna talk about forever a lot and how it's come up in cultures across the world for a long, long time. So it's got some theological origins, right? What was the beginning of the universe? This is paradoxical. 
Because if we think that the universe had a Big Bang type idea, that means it came from nothing. That means that something came from nothing. That's weird. Could that happen again? How did it come from nothing if there was nothing to prompt it? So we've got something weird. It becomes a mathematical model of does one equal zero sometimes? Hmm. So like, what, what is God, right? Is it the greatest finite entity? Is it something bigger than all of us? Is it something that is beyond quantifying? And this was a question that was being asked in ancient Greece and around, because if you say that God is everywhere, then that means that there is never a possibility of absence. That means that there's no such thing as nothing. Well, that means that you can't have zero. Because if everything has something, then there's no such thing as a nothing. So, like, do you have a, a God that's everywhere, but also nothing? Do you have nothing, which kind of forces you to therefore have an absence of God, which means that it has to be finite? Like, it became dense. And, like, this is not a religion class. I'm not looking to challenge anybody's faith. But these were questions that, that you know, many different religions did ask they did challenge and as a result they kind of grew stronger into their foundations or they were able to pivot into different questions and exploration methods um so does that mean like does zero exist is that a number do i have to go and touch it if you want a really good example of this like go try to teach a small child their numbers right you can teach them one use the fingers maybe two three four five no problem try teaching them zero zero is hard Zero takes them a while to figure out. You kind of have to approach it backwards. You got to go to four, then three, then two, then one, then nothing, but then take away the hand and the hand's nothing, or is the hand the nothing? Like it's a, it's a dense, weird issue. So we've got some theological origins. We have some scientific origins. Is there a smallest building block of matter? Something we're still exploring today. We used to think that atoms, atoms literally meant indivisible particles. So, like, was that the fundamental building block of the universe? Well, that means that I can break everything into a smallest number. So, again, I never have a need for zero because I just have a smallest number. We should just be doing math with that, whatever the that is. But then we found we could split that and split that and split that. Can we keep splitting it forever? Modern science right now thinks still maybe not. There might be such a thing as a Planck length, which is the smallest unit of measure that works in the real world. So again, that means that there's a certain cutoff where there's nothing smaller, there just is, we just jump. Anybody here who has taken a chemistry class uh, might have learned about electrons and how they kind of have orbitals around a nucleus, they kind of move around a nucleus. And you might have learned that there's like layers, it's either in like the first layer or the second layer. And it's like, well, what about the between? There's no between. It's either in one layer or the next layer. There's no between, there's no ish, there's no halfway, there's just, is so you give it enough it goes down you take away enough like it goes up like there just is so is that a thing that that belongs in math like is there a smallest leaping point that we just have or do we gradually transition all the time these are good questions mathematical origins right so how many numbers are there between zero and one Many people think there's an infinite number of numbers because then we've got, right, you just keep cutting. Okay, cool. Uh, then how do we say that every number is the same distance away from infinity? How do we confirm that? Again, do we use subtraction? Do we take, pull out a measuring stick, a ruler? Like, I don't know, like, how did we come to this conclusion? Is it just an idea? Is it a has to have? So here's an example, it's a good one to take notes on. Let's explore one of the cardinal sins that will happen in this class for most people. You will plug in infinity into a problem at some point, and I will do my best to slap your hand as quickly as possible, because we're going to see right here and now why that won't work. All right, so we're going to write it down. What is infinity minus one? If you had to make a guess, what do you think infinity minus one would be? Type it in the chat, raise your hand, I don't care. Define it upon itself, kind of recursively, Kayla suggests, we'll make it one less than infinity. But what number would that be? It would remain infinity minus one. A lesser infinite number. Right? Challenging. Challenging here. 
Well, let's think about it. If we have the largest number and I take one away from it, I can't jump immediately to another number. I must have to stay in this realm of really big. And we only have one definition of really big number. That is infinity, right? You take infinity, you try to subtract one. You can't say you land on 99. Like that won't work. You can't say you land on any number. That won't work. You have to stay in the realm of big. So if we take away one, we must still be big. We only have one symbol for that. It's got to be infinity. So I'm going to, I'm going to agree with Manon. So like, we only have one symbol to represent that. That's going to be infinity minus one. So let's go ahead and write this one out, shall we? This will be the first, first reason of why this doesn't work. So we have, what is infinity minus one? Well, it's got to be in the realm of really big. So we're going to say infinity minus one has to be infinity. There's no other possible thing I could put there if I want to give it its own identity. Well, through the rules of math, I'm allowed to subtract infinity from both sides. And that tells me that negative one is equal to zero. Which also opens up the room for a whole bunch of other problems. Like I could add one to both sides. And that all of a sudden means that zero is the same thing as one. I can multiply both sides by 10 or 100. And that tells me that zero is the same thing as 100. Do we start to recognize like where we broke down? Like, like you can't subtract from infinity. It's not a normal number. It does not follow normal number rules. So we can't touch it directly. Versus if I had done this proof with any other number, we would have been able to conclude something that is true. Like this, this, this does not work. You cannot subtract from infinity. You cannot multiply by infinity. You cannot square from infinity. And if you try, you will always be upset. Instead, we have to approach this through a different path of logic. Uh, I got a question. Is infinity the largest number if it continues in both the positive and negative directions and forever? Uh, how, why would it not cancel out? Good. So like if we have, does the idea of infinity continue? I'm going to give you a model. We're going to do that in the next class. I got to give you something to look forward to. Like how do we actually put it on the number line? Can we put it on the number line? I'm going to give you a picture. So look forward to that on next time. We're going to absolutely go through that. Right now, I just feel like I need to blow your mind. Like that's kind of the goal of the entire class right now. All right, mathematical origins. Uh, how many numbers do we have again between zero and one? How can everything be the same distance from infinity? Uh, is it possible? Here's the really big one. Let's talk about movement. If we are moving, then that means we are traveling. We can close a distance. But we would also agree that at any moment, somebody could sneak up and take a photograph of me. Now, in that photograph, I am not moving. We do not have like Harry Potter photos. They're not moving around. We got photos going to be set. So if we assume that every moment of time can be represented with a photograph, then that means that I just have life as a series of photographs. Well, that's a whole bunch of not moving stuff that eventually lets me move. That's weird. We broke something. That's a zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero movement situation became a one type of movement. Like that's, that's, we broke, like that's weird. Zero plus zero plus zero equals one sometimes. Are we sure? Like, are we always moving? Sometimes moving? These are, these are questions. Uh, how big is your hand? Here's a good one, right? Hold up your hand and imagine I needed an idea for how big this is. Square units, right? Like how big is it? We would all agree, probably bigger than a square inch. We could look at our hands, say bigger than a square inch. Got it. All right. Square foot, probably smaller than a square foot. How much is it exactly? Like, I don't have a formula for this. I don't have a pi r squared, like hand r squared. I got nothing. I got nothing to tell me what this, like, how do we figure this out? Do we like, I don't know. Like, you're like, maybe I dip it in ink and I stamp it on some paper. Good. How big is the paper? Like, how big are things we don't have formulas for? We're going to talk about that. How big is an oval? How do we come up with pi? Right? And the, here's the last one. What about square root of two? We're all told that this is an irrational number. Yeah, why? Because it goes on forever? Have we checked? Like, who's checked? I always love this question. They're like, oh, yeah, pi goes on forever. I was like, how do you know? Like, who went out and counted all the numbers and was like, yep, took me forever. Got it. Y'all can just try. Like how, like, how do we know this? All right. So 
quickly, we're going to walk through a little bit of what's going to happen through this course, the cadence. We're going to approach this course in a non-traditional way. If you've already taken this class and you are retaking this class, understand that I'm going to be approaching this in a different way. We will hit all of the same topics, but I'm going to be shuffling their order. We're going to, for the first chunk of class, go through the concepts, the stories, the models, the pictures of calculus. I'm going to try to get you on board as quickly as possible with what is it and why do we care? The second part of class is when we are going to go back through the story and we're going to make it formal. We're going to put on top of it the symbols, the punctuation, those difficult examples, all those gotcha questions, the hard, hard, just pure math parts. And in the third part of the class, we're going to go through the applications. We're going to go through how do I use this in the real world? How do I take it and I use this for optimization? How do I use it with related rates? How do I take these things and go make some money, right? How do I discover truths about the world? We're going to hit that all in the third section. So to kickstart the first, notice that we've got a lot of different cultures over a lot of different time that have all contributed. This is not a field of old white European men. It just so happened that the first textbooks about this were written when the printing press was popular and cheap in Europe, which is why many of these ideas have European names attached to them. But they are standing simply on the shoulders and the achievement of giants from many cultures. So, for example, many people think that the Greeks were the ones who came up with geometry. It was not the Greeks. It was the Egyptians. The Egyptians new geometry way before. That's why they have big things like pyramids. So like it's an African math that the Greeks learned from. And then we have the Chinese who were working mostly in parallel to the Western world when there wasn't a strong exchanging of ideas. We have Archimedes, who was a Greek mathematician, one of my favorites, Archie. You're going to learn a lot about Archie. Like a big, big guy. He is literally the Iron Man of ancient civilization. Like he is the Tony Stark, and I will make an argument for that next class. And then we've got from this culture, we've got a bunch of questions. How is motion possible? We've got paradoxes by philosophers like Zeno asking about how can we move if every moment can be represented as a stationary thing? We've got how does pi exist? This is something that came over from India. Many people might not realize that the Middle East was where algebra came from. That's why it sounds like an Arabic phrase, algebra. So we have cultures that are all cooperating. And then in Europe, about the 1700s, 1600s, we have a compilation of these ideas that did take the form of calculus. So why should you care? Because this class is going to teach you how to model logic, the logic of approach, expectation, precision, the idea of forever. This class will teach you how to answer many questions that you've asked and many questions you have never thought to ask. But as far as where are you going to use it, I'm not probably going to give you all but a few examples throughout the class because I'd rather you come to me and we discuss it one-on-one. -on -one. Like we'll find a way for you to use this. It's applicable, but it, it requires creativity, it requires awareness. Um, and I can tell you when I've used it, when I've used it to make money or I've understood things that others did not. So here's your welcome to calculus. Next class, like I said, we're gonna talk about what are numbers, why are negatives considered real numbers, but imaginary numbers are considered fake by some. Right, we're going to talk about like uh, we we got some blackboard stuff. I'm going to walk you through briefly uh, for your assignments. You get two assignments that you now have access to. You've got your week zero homework uh, with all of the materials and stuff in there. That due date is going to be open, but it's only open because I always want people to be able to go back and do that whether they have yet or not, not because you shouldn't. Week zero is essentially my chance to make sure you understand the class, the materials, the approach, everything that we're doing here. So if you wait on that assignment, you're going to probably feel a little lost in the class and underprepared. And you don't want to fall behind in this class. You really, really don't. Uh, week one is going to be a lot of algebra review. Week two is going to be a lot of algebra review. So I will not be lecturing to those topics. Those are prerequisite topics. I've recorded some uh, supplemental materials. So if you need some help or it's been a while, you need a little dust off, I've got some stuff up there to help you. But I'm not going to dedicate class time to reviewing algebra. That's that's You should come in with that knowledge already. And if you don't have that knowledge already, join me for office hours. I will absolutely help you capture it back. We're just not going to do it when we're all together. Um, 
Now to talk you through Blackboard, if you would, before you leave, please do take time to explore through Blackboard, check out everything in week zero. You've got to read it through. You've got to watch it through. Uh, it's a great way to take that week zero quiz that you will be able to repeat as many times you want and get as high a score as you want. Like I, I want you all to start the year off with an A in the grade book. So like master like just just rock that quiz bring questions to me i will help you crush it um the other thing that i'm going to show you before i let you all go is that after every single class uh with give or take 12 hours because it's going to take me a little bit to review the recording if you go into your week's material this is your week one material right here uh i am going to be making live the lesson material so we just went through what is calculus i'm going to make this available inside of this lesson you have a bunch of things you have the recording which i'll post once i get it available you also have guided notes now these guided notes are not designed for you to take them as we as i lecture i don't want to split your attention i don't want you writing and reading when i'm talking to you but i have these up here because what i want you to do is i want you to print them off after class and try to fill them in if you can fill them in from your notes or your memory, then you've got all the key ideas. If you can't fill them in, then that's a flag that you need to recognize and bring questions to me before the next class. So this is to help you check your understanding. This is not to help you capture the lecture. I've already recorded it for you. You've already got it captured. So try to print this off. Try to fill it in. I'm not collecting it but it will help out. And most of the time it'll include the heavy dense proofs so that you don't have to worry about writing all of that stuff down when I wanna give it to you. I've also got some of the slides that we went through and some supplemental videos that you can watch. I find them interesting. Uh, they might help you out a little bit, but again, this is, this is supplemental because it's not required. All right, that's all that I have for you. I'm gonna stick around for quite a bit to see if anyone has any questions. We can talk through anything. Um, otherwise, I know we have class tomorrow, so I will see you tomorrow. Try to get these guided notes filled in before then. Uh, you really don't wanna fall behind or not have captured a key idea that, that we are gonna be using uh, for days to come. Otherwise, thank you all, and especially thank you to those having the webcams on. I hope you felt like this was interactive. I'm trying to do my part. If you didn't have your webcam on next time, consider it. It's friend, like we all have a good time. And I'll see you. So again, I'm sticking around for any questions you all have as far as if you have questions about grading, accommodations, how things are going to look, math, what we talked through, you name it, I'm here for it.